is Rashane Robbins. We're here at Roper Mountain Science Center in our ecology lab, and I'm our natural science teacher. We are going to talk about endotherms and ectotherms, our cold-blooded and warm-blooded animals. And we're going to introduce two animals to start out. This is Stella, our corn snake. And our second animal, you can probably imagine what kind of animal this is. This is a chinchilla, native to the Andes Mountains, where it's kind of colder, really super soft, dense fur. Um, so we're gonna actually use a certain technology and I want you to look at the infrared camera data as you look at these two animals, especially contrasting the warm-blooded animals holding them, Miss Polar and I. And you'll see different colors and I hope you notice maybe a difference with our snake here. Look at the colors and we're gonna talk about that more at the end. Thank you. All right, so Stella here is our corn snake. She's a vertebrate with lots of scales and she is cold-blooded. Now scientists really don't like that word cold-blooded because do you think their blood is cold? If they've been sitting out on a 90 degree hot summer day on a rock, do you think that their blood is cold? No. So we like to use the word ectotherm. Now ecto and exo are the same stem means outside and therm means heat. Can you think of other words that use either ecto, exo, or therm? And so they get their heat from the outside, from their environment. So if I hold Stella here for like an hour, she'll probably warm up. And so all of these animals have to do something a little bit different. They don't have to eat as much. They get their, their, metabolism from what they eat but for all the different processes they just chill if they don't have enough food or if they are not warm enough they just have to be inactive until they can get food again so here's another animal here in our ecology lab this is the american alligator in our cypress swamp and as you look at this habitat you can probably imagine where the american alligator goes if he's too warm too cold and he's showing off his little scoops those are areas that have lots of capillaries to release excess heat and another habitat here is our beaver pond and we have red-eared sliders here and if you've ever been out on a hike or went to a pond you've probably seen turtles when it's really warm in the heat of the day in a certain spot out. So think about where would these animals go if they're if they need to warm up so that they can do all the things that their body needs to do. And the same thing for fish. So think about far in as your ectotherms, that's your fish, amphibians, reptiles, and invertebrates. All of those are what we call cold-blooded or ectotherms. And then we have two special groups of animals that are endotherms. So that would be mammals, like us, and our chinchilla, and birds. We don't have to rely on our environment for our, our heat. We actually have to eat a ton of food. We need lots of calories. So I want you to go outside and think about and try to look at the birds, look at what kind of calories they're trying to take in, and try to make a bird count and see how many birds come to different feeders or in your backyard and how often you might see the same ones coming to get food. So as you think about your endotherms and ectotherms, think about how they regulate their heat. Now, mammals and birds, um, they have to regulate their heat. So mammals will need to sweat or pant. You've probably seen a dog doing that if they get too hot. Um, we can also add on layers if we need to for us humans. So as you think about your endotherms and ectotherms and adaptations and how those animals might try to cool down or warm up so that they can do all the things their body needs to do. Think about all these animals here at Roper Mountain Science Center and all those even in your backyard.